The sky didn't just darken, it fell. In the 1930s a plague of dust swept the American heartland. Imagine a morning sun swallowed by a monstrous rolling wall of dirt, a black blizzard a thousand feet high racing across the plains. It carried away the topsoil of Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Colorado, turning day into night. Dust, sharp as glass, seeped into every home and every lung. Families fought a daily battle for survival, hanging wet sheets over windows, kneading gritty bread, and watching children cough with dust pneumonia. Farmers saw their livelihoods blown away, their hopes buried under drifts of powder. The relentless wind and dust wore people down, turning the horizon from a symbol of hope into a source of dread. Many gave up, packing their lives into jalopies and heading west, becoming refugees in their own country. This was not just a drought, it was a man-made ecological disaster. The native grasses that once anchored the soil were gone, replaced by a barren, wind-scoured landscape. The American dream of taming the land had become a nightmare. The Great Plains, once a sea of grass, had become a desert, leaving its people to wonder if the land would ever heal. The Dust Bowl's roots ran deep, planted by ambition, ignorance, and the drive for progress. After World War I, soaring wheat prices and new tractors fueled a land rush. Wheat will win the war, was the rallying cry. Farmers tore up millions of acres of native grass, exposing the soil. The great plow-up brought prosperity but ignored the plains' delicate balance. Eastern farming methods clashed with the region's harsh, dry cycles. The land's only defense, deep-rooted grasses, was replaced by shallow wheat. When drought struck in the 1930s, the exposed soil turned to powder, the wheat died, and the wind swept the earth into the sky. The very practices that brought wealth, triggered environmental collapse. The breadbasket of America became a dust bowl. The lesson prosperity built on ignorance of nature's limits is always temporary. The land was left vulnerable and disaster was inevitable. The dust bowl was not fate, it was a consequence. The seeds of disaster had been sown by human hands. Amid the dust and despair, a radical idea emerged. President Franklin D. Roosevelt saw that relief checks weren't enough, the land itself needed healing. In 1934 he proposed planting a massive belt of trees, stretching a thousand miles from Canada to Texas. Critics scoffed, calling it Roosevelt's folly, doubting trees could survive the harsh plains. But Roosevelt's team, guided by new ecological science, believed the right trees, planted the right way, could work. The plan, not a dense forest but strategic windbreaks, rows of hardy trees and shrubs to lift and slow the wind. This was more than environmental, it was social. The project would put thousands to work through the Civilian Conservation Corps and Works Progress Administration. Farmers would help plant and maintain the trees, reclaiming their land. The Great Plains Shelter Belt was a declaration of war on the dust. It was a bold bet that collective action could heal what had been broken. Turning Roosevelt's vision into reality took an army. Launched in 1935, the Prairie State's forestry project united government, scientists, and local farmers. Nurseries grew millions of drought-hardy seedlings, red cedar, green ash, Osage orange. Civilian Conservation Corps and WPA workers dug endless furrows, planting side by side with farmers. Shelter belts were carefully designed, rows of shrubs, medium trees, and tall species to force the wind upward and create calm. Over eight years more than 220 million trees were planted, forming 18,600 miles of shelter belts. The project was a grand experiment, using living windbreaks to reshape the land. It was a massive act of redemption as those who broke the land now worked to heal it. The Great Plains began to change, one tree at a time. The shelter belt's impact was gradual but profound. Wind erosion dropped dramatically where trees stood guard. On one side of the green wall, dust storms raged, on the other calm prevailed, homes became cleaner, air easier to breathe, and daily life less suffocating. For the first time in years families could open windows without fear, the green lines on the horizon became lines of hope, the benefits multiplied calmer microclimates, better soil moisture and higher crop yields. Snow was trapped and melted evenly, nourishing the land. Farmers grew more with less water, a lifeline in a dry region. The trees provided shade for livestock, firewood, and timber for repairs. Shelter belts became an integral part of farm life, paying dividends beyond their original promise. The initial investment was repaid many times over. The green shoots of recovery became a green revolution. 
The shelter belt transformed more than just soil, it reshaped the entire ecosystem. As trees matured, they created new habitats in a once barren landscape. Songbirds returned, their music replacing the mournful wind. Wildlife flourished, deer, pheasants, rabbits, and pollinators found refuge. The project sparked a process of rewilding, enriching biodiversity. For people, the trees broke the monotony, offering shade, beauty, and places for family gatherings. The shelter belts became landmarks and sources of local pride. Farmers developed a new conservation ethic, learning to work with nature. The project became a living classroom, teaching stewardship and long-term thinking. The shelter belt was a constant reminder that human hands could heal as well as harm. It was a legacy of renewal, passed down through generations. The living fences stood as proof that restoration was possible. Despite its success, the shelter belt's future dimmed after World War II. Industrial-scale farming took over, and trees became obstacles to massive machinery. As memories of the Dust Bowl faded, so did appreciation for the trees. Federal support vanished, and maintenance fell to landowners, many of whom saw little value in the shelter belts. Rows of trees were bulldozed for bigger fields, old trees died and gaps appeared. Without care, the green walls thinned, invaded by weeds and disease. Today, much of the original shelter belt is gone or degraded. Its decline is a cautionary tale. The lessons of the past are easily forgotten. Short-term gains replaced long-term safeguards. The fading shelter belt reminds us that environmental solutions need constant vigilance. Its legacy warns that what is built with hope can be lost to neglect. The shelter belt's idea outlived its original form inspiring the world. It became a model for large-scale afforestation to fight desertification. China's Great Green Wall, aiming to halt the Gobi Desert, is a direct descendant. Africa's Great Green Wall stretches across the continent, blending trees with sustainable land management. From Canada to India, echoes of the shelter belt are everywhere. The project proved that governments and communities can restore land together. It showed that ecological and economic goals can align. The seeds planted in the Dust Bowl grew into a global movement for hope. The Shelter Belt story is one of destruction and healing. The Dust Bowl revealed our power to devastate through arrogance and ignorance, but the Shelter Belt showed our capacity for foresight and restoration. It was an act of atonement, a commitment to a better way. The lesson, we hold the power for both harm and good, and our future depends on what we choose to nurture. Sometimes the simplest solutions, like planting trees, are the most profound. Working with nature not against it is key. As we face new environmental crises, the Shelter Belt's lesson is clear. Despair is not an option. Long-term vision and collective action can heal the land. The Shelter Belt stands as a living monument, reminding us of our responsibility to the Earth.